Chapter 5 of Prehistoric Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. K. Edison, New Jersey. Prehistoric Men by Robert J. Braidwood. Chapter 5 More Evidence of Culture. While the dating is not yet sure, the material that we get from caves in Europe must go back to about 100,000 years ago. The time of the classic Neanderthal group followed soon afterwards. We don't know why there is no earlier material in the caves. Apparently, they were not used before the last interglacial phase, the period just before the last great glaciation. We know that men of the classic Neanderthal group were living in caves from about 75,000 to 45,000 years ago. New radioactive carbon dates even suggest that some of the traces of culture we'll describe in this chapter may have lasted to about 35,000 years ago. Probably some of the pre-Neanderthaloid types of men had also lived in caves. But we have so far found their bones in caves only in Palestine and at Fontechevar. The Cave Layers in parts of France, some peasants still live in caves. In prehistoric time, many generations of people lived in them. As a result, many caves have deep layers of debris. The first people moved in and lived on the rock floor. They threw on the floor whatever they didn't want, and they tracked in mud. Nobody bothered to clean house in those days. Their debris, junk and mud and garbage and whatnot, became packed into a layer. As time went on, and generations passed, the layer grew thicker. Then there might have been a break in the occupation of the cave for a while. Perhaps the game animals got scarce, or the people moved away. Or maybe the cave became flooded. Later on, other people moved in and began making a new layer of their own on top of the first layer. Perhaps this process of layering went on in the same cave for a hundred thousand years. While we may find a mix-up in caves, it is not nearly as bad as a mixing up that was done by glaciers. The animal bones and shells, the fireplaces, the bones of men, and the tools the men made all belong together if they come from one layer. That's the reason why the cave of Peking Man is so important. It is also the reason why the caves in Europe and the Near East are so important. We can get an idea of which things belong together and which lot came earliest and which latest. In most cases, prehistoric men lived only in the mouths of caves. They didn't like the dark inner chambers as places to live in. They preferred rock shelters at the basis of overhanging cliffs if there was enough overhang to give shelter. When the weather was good, they no doubt lived in the open air as well. I'll go on using the term cave since it's more familiar, but remember that I really mean a rock shelter as a place in which people actually lived. The most important European cave sites are in Spain, France and Central Europe. There are also sites in England and Italy. A few caves are known in the Near East and Africa, and no doubt more sites will be found when the out-of-the-way parts of Europe, Africa and Asia are studied. An industry defined. We have already seen that the earliest European cave materials are those from the cave of Fontechevar. Movius feels certain that the lowest materials here date back well into the third interglacial stage, that which lay between the wrist, next to the last, and the worm, one, first stage of the last, alpine glaciations. This material consists of an industry of stone tools apparently all made in the flake tradition. This is the first time we have used the word industry. It is useful to call all of the different tools found together in one layer and made of one kind of material an industry. That is, the tools must be found together as man left them. Tools taken from the glacial gravels or from wind-swept desert surfaces or river gravels or any geological deposit are not together in this sense. We might say the latter have only geological, not archaeological, context. Archaeological context means finding things just as men left them, 
we can tell what tools go together in an industrial sense only if we have archaeological context. Up to now, the only things we could have called industries were the worked stone industry and perhaps the worked bone industry of the Peking cave. We could add some of the very clear cases of open-air sites like Olor Gisaili. We couldn't use the term for the stone tools from the glacial gravels because we do not know which tools belonged together. But when the cave materials begin to appear in Europe, we can begin to speak of industries. Most of the European caves of this time contain industries of flint tools alone. The earliest European cave layers. We have just mentioned the industry from what is said to be the oldest inhabited cave in Europe, that is, the industry from the deepest layer of the site at Fontechevar. Apparently, it doesn't amount to much. The tools are made of stone in the flake tradition and are very poorly worked. This industry is called Tyassian. Its type tool seems to be a smallish flake tool, but there are also larger flakes which seem to have been fashioned for hacking. In fact, the type tool seems to be simply a smaller addition of the Clactonian tool. None of the Fontesheva tools are really good. There are scrapers and more or less pointed tools and tools that may have been used for hacking and chopping. Many of the tools from the earlier glacial gravels are better made than those of this first industry we see in a European cave. There is so little of this material available that we do not know which is really typical and which is not. You would probably find it hard to see much difference between this industry and a collection of tools of the type called Clactonian taken from the glacial gravels, especially if the Clactonian tools were small-sized. The stone industry of the bottommost layer of the Mount Carmel cave in Palestine, where somewhat similar tools were found, have also been called Tyassian. I shall have to bring in many unfamiliar words for the names of the industries. The industries are usually named after the places where they were first found, and since these were in most cases in France, most of the names which follow will be of French origin. However, the names have simply become handles and are in use far beyond the boundaries of France. It would be better if we had a non-place name terminology, but archaeologists have not yet been able to agree on such a terminology. The Acheulean Industry Both in France and in Palestine, as well as in some African cave sites, the next layers in the deep caves have an industry in both the core biface and the flake traditions. The core biface tools usually make up less than half of all the tools in the industry. However, the name of the biface type of tool is generally given to the whole industry. It is called the Acheulean, actually a late form of it, as Acheulean is also used for earlier core biface tools taken from the glacial gravels. In Western Europe, the name used is Upper Acheulean or Mycochian. The same terms have been borrowed to name layers E and F of the Taboon cave on Mount Carmel in Palestine. The Acheulean core biface type of tool is worked on two faces so as to give a cutting edge all around. The outline of its front view may be oval or egg-shaped or a quiet pointed pear shape. The large chip scars of the Acheulean core bifaces are shallow and flat. It is suspected that this resulted from the removal of the chips with a wooden club. The deep chip scars of the earlier Abbevillian core biface came from beating the tool against a stone anvil. These tools are really the best and also the final products of the core biface tradition. We first noticed the tradition in the early glacial gravels. Now we see its end, but also its finest examples in the deeper cave levels. The flake tools, which really make up the greater bulk of this industry, are simple scrapers and chips with sharp cutting edges. The habits used to prepare them must have been pretty much the same as those used for at least one of the flake industries we shall mention presently. There is very little else in these early cave layers. We do not have a proper industry of bone tools. 
there are traces of fire and of animal bones and a few shells in palestine there are many more bones of deer than of gazelle in these layers the deer lives in a wetter climate than does the gazelle in the european cave layers the animal bones are those of beasts that live in a warm climate they belonged in the last interglacial period we have not yet found the bones of fossil men definitely in place with this industry flake industries from the caves two more stone industries the levalloisian and the musterian turn up at approximately the same time in the european cave layers their tools seem to be mainly in the flake tradition but according to some of the authorities their preparation also shows some combination with the habits by which the core biface tools were prepared now notice that i don't tell you the levalloisian and the musterian layers are both above the late acheulean layers that is because there may be some kinds of Acheulean industries that are later than some kinds of Mysterian. The same is true of the Levalloisian. There were now several different kinds of habits that men used in making stone tools. These habits were based on either one or the other of the two traditions, core by face or flake, or on combinations of the habits used in the preparation techniques of both traditions. All were popular at about the same time, so we find that people who made one kind of stone tool industry lived in a cave for a while. Then they gave up the cave for some reason, and people with another industry moved in. Then the first people came back, or at least somebody with the same tool-making habits as the first people. Or maybe a third group of tool makers moved in. The people who had these different habits for making their stone tools seem to have moved around a good deal. They no doubt borrowed and exchanged tricks of the trade with each other. There were no patent laws in those days. The extremely complicated interrelationships of the different habits used by toolmakers of this range of time are at least being systematically studied. Monsieur François Baudet has developed a statistical method of great importance for understanding these tool preparation habits. The Levalloisian and Mysterian the easiest Levalloisian tool to spot is a big flake tool. The trick in making it was to fashion carefully a big chunk of stone called the Levalloisian tortoise core because it resembles the shape of a turtle shell, and then to whack this in such a way that a large flake flew off. This large thin flake with sharp cutting edges is a finished Levalloisian tool. There were various other tools in the Levalloisian industry but this is a characteristic Levalloisian tool. There are several typical Mysterian stone tools. Different from the tools of the Levalloisian type, these were made from disc-like cores. There are medium-sized flake side scrapers. There are also some small pointed tools and some small hand axes. The last of these tool types is often a flake worked on both of the flat sides, that is bifacially, there are also pieces of flint worked into the form of crude balls. The pointed tools may have been fixed on shafts to make short jabbing spears. The round flint balls may have been used as bolas. Actually, we don't know what either tool was used for. The mixing of traditions. Nowadays, the archaeologists are less and less sure of the importance of any specific tool type and name. Twenty years ago, they used to speak simply of Acheulean or Levalloisian or Mysterian tools. Now, more and more, all of the tools from some one layer in a cave are called an industry, which is given a mixed name. Thus, we have levalloiso mosterian and acheulio levalloisian and even acheulio mosterian or Mysterian of Acheulean tradition. Bode's systematic work is beginning to clear up some of our confusion. The time of these late Acheulio Levalloso Mosteroid industries is from perhaps as early as 100,000 years ago. It may have lasted until well past 50,000 years ago. This was the time of the first phase of the last great glaciation. It was also the time that the classic group of Neanderthal men was living in Europe. A number of the Neanderthal fossil finds come from these cave layers. 
before the different habits of tool preparation were understood it used to be popular to say neanderthal man was mysterian man i think this is wrong what used to be called mysterian is now known to be a variety of industries with tools of both core biface and flake habits and so mixed that the word mysterian used alone really doesn't mean anything the neanderthalers doubtless understood the tool preparation habits by means of which acheulean levelosian and mysterian type tools were produced we also have the more modern like mount carmel people found in a cave layer of palestine with tools almost entirely in the flake tradition called levelloiso mysterian and the fonteshawar tayasian other suggestions of life in the early cave layers except for the stone tools what do we know of the way men lived in the time range after 100000 to perhaps 40000 years ago or even later we know that in the area from europe to palestine at least some of the people some of the time lived in the fronts of caves and warmed themselves over fires in europe in the cave layers of these times we find the bones of different animals the bones in the lowest layers belong to animals that lived in a warm climate above them are the bones of those who could stand the cold like the reindeer and mammoth thus the meat diet must have been changing as the glacier crept further south shells and possibly fish bones have lasted in these cave layers but there is not a trace of the vegetable foods and the nuts and berries and other wild fruits that must have been eaten when they could be found bone tools have also been found from this period some are called scrapers and there are also long chisel like leg bone fragments believed to have been used for skinning animals larger hunks of bone which seem to have served as anvils or chopping blocks are fairly common bits of mineral used as coloring matter have also been found we don't know what the color was used for there is a small but certain number of cases of intentional burials these burials have been found on the floors of the caves in other words the people dug graves in the places where they lived the holes made for the graves were small for this reason or perhaps for some other the bodies were in curled up or contracted position flint or bone tools or pieces of meat seem to have been put in with some of the bodies in several cases flat stones had been laid over the graves tools from africa and asia about 100000 years ago professor movius characterizes early prehistoric africa as a continent showing a variety of stone industries some of these industries were pure local developments and some were practically identical with industries found in europe at the same time from northwest africa to cape town excepting the tropical rainforest region of the west center tools of developed acheulean levelosian and mousterian types have been recognized often they are named after african place names in east and south africa lived people whose industries show a development of the levelosian technique such industries are called still bay another industry developed on the basis of the acheulean technique is called for smith from the northwest comes an industry with tanged points and flake blades this is called the eterian the tropical rainforest region contained people whose stone tools apparently show adjustments to this peculiar environment the so-called sangoan industry includes stone picks adzes core bifaces of specialized acheulean type and bifacial points which are probably spearheads in western asia even as far as the east coast of india the tools of the eurafrican core biface and flake tool traditions continued to be used but in the far east as we noted in the last chapter men had developed characteristic stone chopper and chopping tools this tool preparation tradition basically a pebble tool tradition lasted to the very end of the ice age when more intact open air sites such as that of an earlier time at alorgesailly and more stratified cave sites are found and excavated in asia and africa we shall be able to get a more complete picture so far our picture of the general 
cultural level of the old world at about hundred thousand years ago and soon afterwards is best from europe but it is still far from complete there too culture at the beginning of the last great glacial period the few things we have found must indicate only a very small part of the total activities of the people who lived at the time all of the things they made of wood and bark of skins of anything soft are gone the fact that burials were made at least in europe and palestine is pretty clear proof that the people had some notion of a life after death but what this notion really was or what gods if any men believed in we cannot know dr movius has also reminded me of the so-called bear cults cases in which caves have been found which contain the skulls of bears in apparently purposeful arrangement this might suggest some notion of holding up the spirits or the strength of bears killed in the hunt probably the people lived in small groups as hunting and food gathering seldom provide enough food for large groups of people these groups probably had some kind of leader or chief very likely the rude beginnings of rules for community life and politics and even law were being made but what these were we do not know we can only guess about such things as we can only guess about many others for example how the idea of a family must have been growing and how there may have been witch doctors who made beginnings in medicine or in art in the materials they gathered for their trade the stone tools help us most they have lasted and we can find them as they come to us from this cave or that and from this layer or that the tool industries show a variety of combinations of the different basic habits or traditions of tool preparation this seems only natural as the groups of people must have been very small the mixtures and blendings of the habits used in making stone tools must mean that there were also mixtures and blends in many of the other ideas and beliefs of these small groups and what this probably means is that there was one culture of the time it is certainly unlikely that there were simply three cultures acheulean levalosian and mousterian as has been thought in the past rather there must have been a great variety of loosely related cultures at about the same stage of advancement we could say too that here we really begin to see for the first time that remarkable ability of men to adapt themselves to a variety of conditions we shall see this adaptive ability even more clearly as time goes on and the record becomes more complete over how great an area did these loosely related cultures reach in the time seventy five thousand to forty five thousand or even as late as thirty five thousand years ago we have described stone tools made in one or another of the flake or core biface habits for an enormous area it covers all of europe all of africa the near east and parts of india it is perfectly possible that the flake and core biface habits lasted on after thirty five thousand years ago in some places outside of europe in northern africa for example we are certain that they did on the other hand in the far east china burma java and in northern india the tools of the old chopper tool tradition were still being made out there we must assume there was a different set of loosely related cultures at least there was a different set of loosely related habits for the making of tools but the men who made them must have looked much like the men of the west their tools were different but just as useful as to what the men of the west looked like i have already hinted at all we know so far the neanderthalers were present at the time some more modern like men must have been about too since fossils of them have turned up at mount carmel in palestine and at tashik tash in transcaspian russia it is still too soon to know whether certain combinations of tools within industries were made only by certain physical types of men but since tools of both the core by face and the flake traditions and their blends turn up from south africa to england to india it is most unlikely that only one type of man used only one particular habit in the preparation of tools what seems perfectly clear is that men in africa and men in india were making just as good tools as the men who lived in western europe 
End of chapter 5 More Evidence of Culture Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey Chapter 6 of Prehistoric Men This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. Prehistoric Men by Robert J. Braidwood. Chapter 6. Early Moderns. For some time, during the first interstadial of the last great glaciation, say sometime after about 40,000 years ago, we have more accurate dates for the European Mediterranean area and less accurate ones for the rest of the old world. This is probably because the effects of the last glaciation have been studied in the European Mediterranean area more than they have been elsewhere. A new tradition appears. Something new was probably beginning to happen in the European Mediterranean area about 40,000 years ago, though all the rest of the old world seems to have been going on as it had been. I can be sure of this because the information we are using as a basis for dates is very inaccurate for the areas outside of Europe and the Mediterranean. We can at least make a guess. In Egypt and North Africa, men were still using the old methods of making stone tools. This was especially true of flake tools of the Levalloisian type, save that they were growing smaller and smaller as time went on. But at the same time, a new tradition was becoming popular in westernmost Asia and in Europe. This was a blade tool tradition. Blade tools. A stone blade is really just a long parallel sided flake. It has sharp cutting edges and makes a very useful knife. The real trick is to be able to make one. It is almost impossible to make a blade out of any stone but flint or a natural volcanic glass called obsidian. And even if you have flint or obsidian, you first have to work up a special cone-shaped blade core from which to whack off blades. You whack with a hammer stone against a bone or antler punch which is directed at the proper place on the blade core. The blade core has to be well supported or gripped while this is going on. To get a good flint blade tool takes a great deal of know-how. Remember that a tradition in stone tools means no more than that some particular way of making the tools got started and lasted a long time. Men who made some tools in one tradition or set of habits would also make other tools for different purposes by means of another tradition or set of habits. It was even possible for the two sets of habits to become combined. The earliest blade tools. The oldest blade tools we have found were deep down in the layers of the Mount Carmel caves in Taboon, EB and EA. Similar tools have been found in equally early cave levels in Syria. Their popularity there seems to fluctuate a bit. Some more or less parallel sided flakes are known in the Levalloisian industry in France, but they are probably no earlier than Taboon E. The Taboon blades are part of a local late Acheulean industry, which is characterized by core biface hand axes, but which has many flake tools as well. Professor F. E. Zuna believes that this industry may be more than 120,000 years old. Actually, its date has not yet been fixed, but it is very old, older than the fossil finds of modern like men in the same caves. For some reason, the habit of making blades in Palestine and Syria was interrupted. Blades only reappeared there at about the same time they were first made in Europe, sometime after 45,000 years ago, that is, after the first phase of the last glaciation was ended. We are not sure just where the earliest persisting habits for the production of blade tools developed. Impressed by the very early momentary appearance of blades at Taboon on Mount Carmel, Professor Dorothy A. Garrett first favored the Near East as a center of origin. She spoke of some as yet unidentified Asiatic center, which she thought might be in the highlands of Iran or just beyond. But more recent work has been done in this area, especially by Professor Kuhn, 
and the blade tools do not seem to have an early appearance there. When the blade tools reappear in the Syrio-Palestinian area, they do so in industries which also include Levalloiso Mousterian flake tools. From the point of view of form and workmanship, the blade tools themselves are not so fine as those which seem to be making their appearance in Western Europe about the same time. There is a characteristic Syro-Palestinian flake point, possibly a projectile tip, called the Emiran, which is not known from Europe. The appearance of blade tools, together with Levalloiso Mousterian flakes, continues even after the Emiran point has gone out of use. It seems clear that the production of blade tools did not immediately swamp the set of older habits in Europe, too. The use of flake tools also continued there. This was not so apparent to the older archaeologists, whose attention was focused on individual tool types. It is not, in fact, impossible, although it is certainly not proved, that the technique developed in the preparation of the Levalloisian tortoise core and the striking of the Levalloisian flake from it might have followed through to the conical core and punch technique for the production of blades. Professor Garrod is much impressed with the speed of change during the later phases of the last glaciation and its probable consequences. She speaks of the greater number of industries having enough individual character to be classified as distinct, since evolution now starts to outstrip diffusion. Her evolution here is, of course, an industrial evolution rather than a biological one. Certainly, the people of Europe had begun to make blade tools during the warm spell after the first phase of the last glaciation. By about 40,000 years ago, blades were well established. The bones of the blade tool makers we have found so far indicate that anatomically, modern men had now certainly appeared. Unfortunately, only a few fossil men have so far been found from the very beginning of the blade tool range in Europe or elsewhere. What I certainly shall not tell you is that conquering bands of fine, strong, anatomically modern men armed with superior blade tools came sweeping out of the east to exterminate the lowly Neanderthalers. Even if we don't know exactly what happened, I'd lay a good bet it wasn't that simple. We do know a good deal about different blade industries in Europe. Almost all of them come from cave layers. There is a great deal of complication in what we find. You will realize that all this complication comes not only from the fact that we are finding more material, it is due also to the increasing ability of men to adapt themselves to a great variety of situations. Their tools indicate this adaptiveness. We know there was a good deal of climactic change at this time, the plants and animals that men used for food were changing too. The great variety of tools and industries we now find reflect these changes and the ability of men to keep up with the times. Now, for example, is the first time we are sure that there are tools to make other tools. They also show men's increasing ability to adapt themselves. Special Types of Blade Tools the most useful tools that appear at this time were made from blades. 1. The backed blade. This is a knife made of a flint blade with one edge purposely blunted, probably to save the user's fingers from being cut. There are several shapes of backed blades. 2. The burin or graver. The burin was the original chisel. Its cutting edge is transverse like a chisel's. Some burins are made like a screwdriver, save that burins are sharp. Others have edges more like the blade of a chisel or a push plane with only one bevel. Burins were probably used to make slots in wood and bone, that is to make handles or shafts for other tools. They must also be the tools with which much of the engraving on bone was done. There is a bewildering variety of different kinds of burins. 3. The Tanked Point These stone points were used to tip arrows or light spears. They were made from blades, and they had a long tang at the bottom where they were fixed to the shaft. At the place where the tang met the main body of the stone point, there was a marked shoulder, the beginnings of a barb. Such points had either one or two shoulders. 
4. The notched or strangulated blade. Along with the points for arrows or light spears must go a tool to prepare the arrow or spear shaft. Today such a tool would be called a draw knife or a spoke shave. And this is what the notched blades probably are. Are spoke shaves of sharp straight cutting blades and really shave. Notched blades of flint probably scraped rather than cut. 5. The awl, drill or borer. These blade tools are worked out to a spike-like point. They must have been used for making holes in wood, bone, shell, skin or other things. 6. The end scraper on a blade is a tool with one or both ends worked so as to give a good scraping edge. It could have been used to hollow out wood or bone, scrape hides, remove bark from trees and a number of other things. There is one very special type of flint tool which is best known from Western Europe in an industry called the Solutrean. These tools were usually made of blades, but the best examples are so carefully worked on both sides, bifacially, that it is impossible to see the original blade. The tool is 7. The Laurel Leaf Point Some of these tools were long and dagger-like and must have been used as knives or daggers. Others were small, called willow leaf, and must have been mounted on spear or arrow shafts. Another typical solitary tool is a shouldered point. The industries characterized by tools in the blade tradition also yield some flake and core tools. We will end this list with two types of tools that appear at this time. The first is made of a flake, the second is a core tool. 8. The keel-shaped round scraper is usually small and quite round and has had chips removed up to a peak in the center. It is called keel-shaped because it is supposed to look when upside down like a section through a boat. Actually, it looks more like a tent or an umbrella. Its outer edges are sharp all the way around and it is probably a general purpose scraping tool. 9. The keel-shaped nosed scraper is a much larger and heavier tool than the round scraper. It was made on a core with a flat bottom and has one nicely worked end or nose. Such tools are usually large enough to be easily grasped and probably were used like push planes. The stone tools, usually made of flint, we have just listed, are among the most easily recognized blade tools, although they show differences in detail at different times. There are also many other kinds. Not all of those tools appear in any one industry at one time. Thus, the different industries each have only some of the blade tools we have just listed, and also a few flake tools. Some industries even have a few core tools. The particular types of blade tools appearing in one cave layer or another, and the frequency of appearance of the different types, tell which industry we have in each layer. Other kinds of tools. By this time in Europe, say about 40,000 to about 10,000 years ago, we begin to find other kinds of material too. Bone tools begin to appear. There are knives, pins, needles with eyes and little double-pointed straight bars of bone that were probably fish hooks. The fish line would have been fastened in the center of the bar. When the fish swallowed the bait, the bar would have caught crosswise in the fish's mouth. One quite special kind of bone tool is a long flat point for a light spear. It has a deep notch cut up into the breadth of its base and is called split-based bone point. We know examples of bone beads from these times and of bone handles for flint tools. Pierced teeth of some animals were worn as beads or pendants, but I am not sure that elk's teeth were worn this early. There are even spool-shaped buttons or toggles. Antler came into use for tools, especially in Central and Western Europe. We do not know the use of one particular antler tool that has a large hole board in one end. One suggestion is that it was a thong stropper used to strop or work up hide thongs. Another suggestion is that it was a narrow shaft straightener. Another interesting tool, usually of antler, is a spear thrower, which is little more than a stick with a notch or hook on one end. The hook fits into the butt end of the spear, 
and the length of the spear thrower allows you to put much more power into the throw. It works on pretty much the same principle as a sling. Very fancy harpoons of antler were also made in the latter half of the period in Western Europe. These harpoons had barbs on one or both sides and a base which would slip out of the shaft. Some have engraved decoration. The beginning of art. In Western Europe, at least, the period saw the beginning of several kinds of artwork. It is handy to break the art down into two great groups, the movable art and the cave paintings and sculpture. The movable art group includes the scratchings, engravings and modeling which decorate tools and weapons. Knives, stroppers, spear throwers, harpoons and sometimes just plain fragments of bone or antler are often carved. There is also a group of large flat pebbles which seem almost to have served as sketch blocks. The surfaces of these various objects may show animals or rather abstract floral designs or geometric designs. Some of the movable art is not done on tools. The most remarkable examples of this class are little figures of women. These women seem to be pregnant and their most female characteristics are much emphasized. It is thought that these Venus or Mother Goddess figurines may be meant to show the great forces of nature fertility and the birth of life. Cave paintings. In the paintings on walls and ceilings of caves, we have some examples that compare with the best art of any time. The subjects were usually animals, the great cold weather beasts of the end of the Ice Age, the mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros, the bison, the reindeer, the wild horse, the bear, the wild boar, and wild cattle. As in the movable art, there are different styles in the cave art. The really great cave art is pretty well restricted to southern France and Cantabrian, northwestern Spain. There are several interesting things about the Franco-Cantabrian cave art. It was done deep down in the darkest and most dangerous parts of the caves, although the men lived only in the openings of the caves. If you think what they must have had for lights, crude lamps of hollowed stone have been found, which must have burned some kind of oil or grease with a matted hair of fiber wick, and of the animals that may have lurked in the caves, you'll understand the part about danger. Then, too, we are sure the pictures these people painted were not simply to be looked at and admired, for they painted one picture right over other pictures which had been done earlier. Clearly, it was the act of painting that counted. The painter had to go way down into the most mysterious depths of the earth and create an animal in paint. Possibly he believed that by doing this he gained some sort of magic power over the same kind of animal when he hunted it in the open air. It certainly doesn't look as if he cared very much about the picture he painted, as a finished product to be admired, for he or somebody else soon went down and painted another animal right over the one he had done. The cave art of the Franco-Cantabrian style is one of the great artistic achievements of all time. The subjects drawn are almost always the larger animals of the time, the bison, wild cattle and horses, the woolly rhinoceros, the mammoth, the wild boar and the bear. In some of the best examples, the beasts are drawn in full color and the paintings are remarkably alive and charged with energy. They come from the hands of men who knew the great animals well knew the feel of the fur, the tremendous drive of the muzzles, and the danger one faced when he hunted them. Another artistic style has been found in eastern Spain. It includes lively drawings, often of people hunting with bow and arrow. The East Spanish art is found on open rock faces and in rock shelters. It is less spectacular and apparently more reasoned than the Franco-Cantabrian cave art. Life at the End of the Ice Age in Europe Life in these times was probably as good as a hunter could expect it to be. Game and fish seem to have been plentiful. Berries and wild fruits probably were too. From France to Russia, great pits or piles of animal bones have been found. Some of this killing was done as our plains Indians killed the buffalo, by stampeding them over steep river banks or cliffs. There were also good tools for hunting, however. In Western Europe, 
people lived in the openings of caves and under overhanging rocks. On the great plains of Eastern Europe, very crude huts were being built, half underground. The first part of this time must have been cold, for it was the middle and end phases of the last great glaciation. Northern Europe, from Scotland to Scandinavia, northern Germany and Russia, and also the higher mountains of the south, were certainly covered with ice. But people had fire, and the needles and tools that were used for scraping hides must mean that they wore clothing. It is clear that men were thinking of a great variety of things beside the tools that helped them get food and shelter. Such burials as we find have more grave gifts than before. Beads and ornaments, and often flint, bone, or antler tools, are included in the grave, and sometimes the body is sprinkled with red ochre. Red is the color of blood, which means life, and of fire, which means heat. Professor Child wonders if the red ochre was a pathetic attempt at magic, to give back to the body the heat that had gone from it. But pathetic or not, it is sure proof that these peoples were already moved by death, as men still are moved by it. Their art is another example of the direction the human mind was taking. And when I say human, I mean it in the fullest sense, for this is the time in which fully modern man has appeared. We spoke of the Cro-Magnon group, and of the coombe keppel brune group of Caucasoids, and of the Grimaldi Negroids, who are no longer believed to be Negroid. I doubt that any one of these groups produced more of the achievements of the times. It's not yet absolutely sure which particular group produced the great cave art. The artists were almost certainly a blend of several, no doubt already mixed groups. The pair of Grimaldians were buried in a grave with a sprinkling of red ochre and were provided with shell beads and ornaments and with some blade tools of flint. Regardless of the different names once given them by the human paleontologists, each of these groups seems to have shared equally in the cultural achievements of the times for all that the archaeologists can say. Microliths One peculiar set of tools seems to serve as a marker for the very last phase of the Ice Age in southwestern Europe. This tool-making habit is also found above the shore of the Mediterranean basin, and it moved into northern Europe as the last glaciation pulled northward. People began making blade tools of very small size. They learned how to chip very slender and tiny blades from a prepared core. Then they made these little blades into tiny triangles, half-moons, lunates, trapezoids, and several other geometric forms. These little tools are called microliths. They are so small that most of them must have been fixed in handles or shafts. We have found several examples of microliths mounted in shafts. In northern Europe, where their use soon spread, the microlithic triangles or lunates were set in rows down each side of a bone or wood point. One corner of each little triangle stuck out, and the whole thing made a fine barbed harpoon. In historic times in Egypt, geometric trapezoidal microliths were still in use as arrowheads. They were fastened, broadened out, on the end of a narrow shaft. It seems queer to give an arrow a point shaped like a T. Actually, the little points were very sharp and must have pierced the heights of animals very easily. We also think that the broader cutting edge of the point may have caused more bleeding than a pointed arrowhead would. In hunting fleet-footed animals like the gazelle, which might run for miles after being shot with an arrow, it was an advantage to cause as much bleeding as possible for the animal who would drop sooner. We are not really sure where the microliths were first invented. There is some evidence that they appear early in Near East. Their use was very common in Northwest Africa, but this came later. The microlith makers who reached South Russia and Central Europe possibly moved up out of the Near East. Or it may have been the other way around. We simply don't yet know. Remember that the microliths we are talking about here were made from carefully prepared little blades and are often geometric in outline. Each microlithic industry proper was made up, in good part, of such tiny blade tools. 
but there were also some normal sized blade tools and even some flake scrapers in most microlithic industries i emphasize this bladelet and the geometric character of the microlithic industries of the western old world since there has sometimes been confusion in the matter sometimes small flake chips utilized as minute pointed tools have been called microliths they may be microlithic in size in terms of the general meaning of the word but they do not seem to belong to the subtradition of the blade tool preparation habits which we have been discussing here later blade tool industries of the near east and africa the blade tool industries of normal size we talked about earlier spread from europe to central siberia we noted that blade tools were made in western asia too and early although professor garrett is no longer sure that the whole tradition originated in the near east in western asia i list some of the names of the western european industries with the qualification like for example gravettian like the western asiatic blade tool industries do vaguely recall some aspects of those of western europe but we would probably be better off if we used completely local names for them the emiran is such an example its industry included a long spike like blade point which is no western european counterpart when we last spoke of africa i told you that stone tools there were continuing in the levalloisian flakes tradition and were becoming smaller at some time during this process two new tool types appeared in northern africa one was the etarian point with a tang and the other was a sort of laurel leaf point called the esbekian these two tool types were both produced from flakes the esbekian points especially are roughly similar to some of the solutrean points of europe it has been suggested that both the esbekian and etarian points may be seen on the way to france through their appearance in the spanish cape deposits of papayo but there is also a rival pre solutrean in central europe we still do not know whether there was any contact between the makers of these north african tools and the solutrean tool makers what does seem clear is that the blade tool tradition itself arrived late in northern africa nether africa blade tools and laurel leaf points and some other probably late stone tool types also appear in central and southern africa there are geometric microliths on bladelets and even some coarse pottery in eastern africa there is as yet no good way of telling just where these items belong in time in broad geological terms they are late some people have guessed that they are as early as similar european and near eastern examples but i doubt it the makers of small sized levalloisian flake tools occupied much of africa until very late in time the far east india and the far east still seem to be going their own way in india some blade tools have been found these are not well dated save that we believe they must be post pleistocene in far east it looks as if the old chopper tool tradition was still continuing for burma dr movius feels this is fairly certain for china he feels even more certain actually we know very little about the far east at about the time of the last glaciation this is a shame too as you will soon agree the new world becomes inhabited at some time toward the end of the last great glaciation almost certainly after 20000 years ago people began to move over bering strait from asia into america as you know the american indians have been assumed to be basically mongoloids new studies of blood group types make this somewhat uncertain but there is no doubt that the ancestors of the american indians came from asia the stone tool traditions of europe africa and near and middle east and central siberia did not move into the new world with only a few special or late exceptions there are no core bifaces flakes or blade tools of the old world such things just haven't been found here this is why i say it's a shame we don't know more of the end of the chopper tool tradition in the far east according to weidenreich the mongoloids were in the far east long before the end of the last glaciation if the genetics of the blood group types do demand a non-mongoloid ancestry for the american indians 
who else may have been in the Far East 25,000 years ago? We know a little about the habits for making stone tools which these first people brought with them, and these habits don't conform with those of the Western Old World. We'd better keep our eyes open for whatever happened to the end of this chopper tool tradition in northern China. Already there are hints that it lasted late there. Also, we should watch future excavations in eastern Siberia. Perhaps we shall find the chopper tool tradition spreading up that far. The New Era Perhaps it comes in part from the way I read the evidence and perhaps, in part, it is only intuition. But I feel that the materials of this chapter suggest a new era in the ways of life. Before about 40,000 years ago, people simply gathered their food, wandering over large areas to scavenge or to hunt in a simple sort of way. But here we have seen them settling in, more perhaps restricting themselves in their wanderings and adapting themselves to a given locality in more intensive ways. This intensification might be suggested by the word collecting. The ways of life we described in the earlier chapters were food-gathering ways, but now an era of food collecting has begun. We shall see further intensifications of it in the next chapter. End of chapter 6 Early Moderns Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey Chapter 7 of Prehistoric Men This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Prehistoric Men by Robert J. Braidwood End and Prelude Up to the end of the last glaciation, we prehistorians have a relatively comfortable time schedule. The farther back we go, the less exact we can be about time and details. Elbow room of five, ten, even fifty or more thousands of years becomes available for us to maneuver in as we work backward in time. But now our story has come forward to the point where more exact methods of dating are at hand. The radioactive carbon method reaches back into the span of the last glaciation. There are other methods developed by the geologists and paleobotanists which supplement and extend the usefulness of the radioactive carbon dates. And happily, as our means of being more exact increases, our story grows more exciting. There are also more details of culture for us to deal with which add to the interest. Changes at the End of the Ice Age The last great glaciation of the Ice Age was a two-part affair, with a subphase at the end of the second part. In Europe, the last subphase of this glaciation commenced somewhere around 15,000 years ago. Then the glaciers began to melt back for the last time. Remember that Professor Antevs isn't sure the Ice Age is over yet. This melting sometimes went by fits and starts, and the weather wasn't always changing for the better but there was at least one time when European weather was even better than it is now. The melting back of the glaciers and the weather fluctuations caused other changes, too. We know a fair amount about these changes in Europe. In an earlier chapter, we said that the whole Ice Age was a matter of continual change over long periods of time. As the last glaciers began to melt back, some interesting things happened to mankind. In Europe, along with the melting of the last glaciers, geography itself was changing. Britain and Ireland had certainly become islands by 5000 BC. The Baltic was sometimes a salt sea, sometimes a large freshwater lake. Forests began to grow where the glaciers had been, and in what had once been the cold tundra areas in front of the glaciers. The great cold-weather animals, the mammoth and the woolly rhinoceros, retreated northward and finally died out. It is probable that the efficient hunting of the earlier people of 20,000 or 25,000 to about 12,000 years ago had helped this process along. 
Europeans, especially those of the post-glacial period, had to keep changing to keep up with the times. The archaeological materials for the time, from 10,000 to 6,000 BC, seem simpler than those of the previous 5,000 years. The great cave art of France and Spain had gone. So had the fine carving in bone and antler. Smaller, speedier animals were moving into the new forests. New ways of hunting them, or ways of getting other food, had to be found. Hence, new tools and weapons were necessary. Some of the people who moved into northern Germany were successful reindeer hunters. Then the reindeer moved off to the north, and again new sources of food had to be found. The readjustments completed in Europe. After a few thousand years, things began to look better, or at least we can say this, by about 6,000 B.C., we again get hotter archaeological materials. The best of these come from the North European area, Britain, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, North Germany, southern Norway, and Sweden. Much of this northern European material comes from bogs and swamps where it had become waterlogged and has kept very well. Thus, we have much more complete assemblages than for any time earlier. The best known of these assemblages is the Magdalamosian, named after a great Danish peat swamp where much has been found. In the Magdalamosian assemblage, the flint industry was still very important. Blade tools, tanged arrow points, and burns were still made, but there were also axes for cutting the trees in the new forests. Moreover, the tiny microlithic blades in a variety of geometric forms are also found. Thus, a specialized tradition that possibly began east of the Mediterranean had reached northern Europe. There was also a ground stone industry. Some axes and club heads were made by grinding and polishing rather than by chipping. The industries in bone and antler show a great variety of tools, axes, fish hooks, fish spears, handles, and hafts for other tools, harpoons, and clubs. A remarkable industry in wood has been preserved. Paddles, sled runners, handles for tools, and bark floats for fish nets have been found. There are even fish nets made of plant fibers. Canoes of some kind were no doubt made. Bone and antler tools were decorated with simple patterns, and amber was collected. Wooden bows and arrows are found. It seems likely that the Maglodemosian bog finds are remains of summer camps, and that in winter the people move to higher and drier regions. Child calls them the forest folk. They probably lived much the same sort of life as did our pre-agricultural Indians of the north-central states. They hunted small game or deer. They did a great deal of fishing. They collected what plant food they could find. In fact, their assemblage shows us again that remarkable ability of men to adapt themselves to change. They had succeeded in domesticating the dog. He was still a very wolf-like dog, but his long association with mankind had now begun. Professor Kuhn believes that these people were direct descendants of the men of the glacial age and that they had much the same appearance. He believes that most of the Ice Age survivors still extant are living today in the northwestern European area. South and Central Europe, perhaps, as readjusted as the North. There is always one trouble with things that come from areas where preservation is exceptionally good. The very quantity of materials in such an assemblage tends to make things from other areas look poor and simple although they may not have been so originally at all. The assemblages of the people who live to the south of the Maglamosian area may also have been quite large and varied, but unfortunately relatively little of the southern assemblages has lasted. The waterlogged sites of the Maglamosian area preserved a great deal more. Hence, the Maglamosian itself looks quite advanced to us when we compare it with the few things that have happened to last in other areas. If we could go back and wander over the Europe of 8,000 years ago, we would probably find that the peoples of France, Central Europe, and South Central Russia were just as advanced as those of the North European Baltic belt.
south of the north european belt the hunting food collecting peoples were living on as best they could during this time one interesting group which seems to have kept to the regions of sandy soil and scrub forest made great quantities of geometric microliths these are the materials called tardinosian the materials of the forest folk of france and central europe generally are called azilian dr movius believes the term might best be restricted to the area south of the loire river how much real change was there you can see that no really basic change in the way of life has yet been described child sees the problem that faced the europeans of ten thousand to three thousand b c as a problem in readaptation to the post-glacial forest environment by six thousand b c some quite successful solutions of the problem like the maglemosian had been made the upsets that came with the melting of the last ice gradually brought about all sorts of changes in the tools and food-getting habits but the people themselves were still just as much simple hunters fishers and food collectors as they had been in twenty five thousand b c it could be said that they changed just enough so that they would not have to change but there is a bit more to it than this professor mathiason of copenhagen who knows the archaeological remains of this time very well poses a question he speaks of the material as being neither rich nor progressive in fact rather stagnant but he goes on to add that the people had a certain receptiveness and were able to adapt themselves quickly when the next change did come my own understanding of the situation is that the forest folk made nothing as spectacular as had the producers of the earlier magdalenian assemblage and the franco cantabrian art on the other hand they seem to have been making many more different kinds of tools for many more different kinds of tasks than had their ice age forerunners i emphasize seem because the preservation in the maglemosian bogs is very complete certainly we cannot list anywhere near as many different things for earlier times as we did for the maglemosians i believe this experimentation with all kinds of new tools and gadgets this intensification of adaptiveness this receptiveness even if it is still only pointed toward hunting fishing and food collecting is an important thing remember that the only marker we have handy for the beginning of this tendency toward receptiveness and experimentation is the little microlithic blade tools of various geometric forms these we saw began before the last ice had melted away and they lasted on in use for a very long time i wish there were a better marker than the microliths but i do not know of one remember too that as yet we can only use the microliths as a marker in europe and about the mediterranean changes in other areas all this last section was about europe how about the rest of the world when the last glaciers were melting away we simply don't know much about this particular time in other parts of the world except in europe the mediterranean basin and the middle east people were certainly continuing to move into the new world by way of siberia and the bering strait about this time but for the greater part of africa and asia we do not know exactly what was happening some day we shall no doubt find out today we are without clear information real change and prelude in the near east the appearance of the microliths and the developments made by the forest folk of northwestern europe also mark an end they show us the terminal phase of the old food collecting way of life it grows increasingly clear that at about the same time that the maglemosian and other forest folk were adapting themselves to hunting fishing and collecting in new ways to fit the post-glacial environment something completely new was being made ready in western asia unfortunately we do not have as much understanding of the climate and environment of the late ice age in western asia as we have for most of europe probably the weather was never so violent or life quite so rugged as it was in northern europe we know that the microliths made their appearance in western asia at least by ten thousand b c and possibly earlier 
marking the beginning of the terminal phase of food collecting. Then, gradually, we begin to see the build-up towards the first basic change in human life. This change amounted to a revolution just as important as the Industrial Revolution. In it, men first learned to domesticate plants and animals. They began producing their food instead of simply gathering or collecting it. When their food production became reasonably effective, people could and did settle down in village farming communities. With the appearance of the little farming villages, a new way of life was actually underway. Professor Child has good reason to speak of the food-producing revolution, for it was indeed a revolution. Questions about cause We do not yet know how and why this great revolution took place. We are only just beginning to put the questions properly. I suspect the answers will concern some delicate and subtle interplay between man and nature. Clearly, both the level of culture and the natural condition of the environment must have been ready for the great change before the change itself could come about. It is going to take years of cooperative fieldwork by both archaeologists and the natural scientists who are most helpful to them before the how and why answers begin to appear. Anthropologically trained archaeologists are fascinated with the cultures of men in times of great change. About ten or twelve thousand years ago, the general level of culture in many parts of the world seems to have been ready for change. In northwestern Europe, we saw that cultures change just enough so that they would not have to change. We linked this to environmental changes with the coming of post-glacial times. In Western Asia, we archaeologists can prove that the food-producing revolution actually took place. We can see the important consequence of effective domestication of plants and animals in the appearance of the settled village farming community and within the village farming community was the seed of civilization the way in which effective domestication of plants and animals came about however must also be linked closely with the natural environment thus the archaeologists will not solve the how and why questions alone they will need the help of interested natural scientists in the field itself preconditions for the revolution Especially at this point in our story, we must remember how culture and environment go hand in hand. Neither plants nor animals domesticate themselves. Men domesticate them. Furthermore, men usually domesticate only those plants and animals which are useful. There is a good question here. What is cultural usefulness? But I shall sidestep it to save time. Men cannot domesticate plants and animals that do not exist in the environment where the men live. Also, there are certainly some animals, and probably some plants, that resist domestication, although they might be useful. This brings me back again to the point that both the level of culture and the natural condition of the environment, with the proper plants and animals in it, must have been ready before domestication could have happened. But this is a precondition, not cause. Why did effective food production happen first in the Near East? Why did it happen independently in the New World slightly later? Why also in the Far East? Why did it happen at all? Why are all human beings still not living as the Maglamosians did? These are the questions we still have to face. Cultural Receptiveness and Promising Environments Until the archaeologists and the natural scientists botanists, geologists, zoologists, and general ecologists have spent many more years on the problem, we shall not have full how and why answers. I do think, however, that we are beginning to understand what to look for. We shall have to learn much more of what makes the cultures of men receptive and experimental. Did change in the environment alone force it? Was it simply a case of Professor Toynbee's challenge and response? I cannot believe the answer is quite that simple. Were it so simple, we should want to know why the change hadn't come earlier, along with earlier environmental changes. We shall not know the answer, however, until we have excavated the traces of many more cultures of the time in question. 
we shall doubtless also have to learn more about and think imaginatively about the simpler cultures still left today the mechanics of culture in general will be bound to interest us it will also be necessary to learn much more of the environments of ten thousand to twelve thousand years ago in which regions of the world were the natural conditions most promising did this promise include plants and animals which could be domesticated or did it only offer new ways of food collecting there is much work to do on this problem but we are beginning to get some general hints before i begin to detail the hints we now have from western asia i want to do two things first i shall tell you of an old theory as to how food production might have appeared secondly i will bother you with some definitions which should help us in our thinking as the story goes on an old theory as to the cause of the revolution the idea that change would result if the balance between nature and culture became upset is of course not a new one for at least twenty-five years there has been a general theory as to how the food-producing revolution happened this theory depends directly on the idea of natural change in the environment the first five thousand years following about ten thousand b c must have been very difficult ones the theory begins these were the years when the most marked melting of the last glaciers was going on while the glaciers were in place the climate to the south of them must have been different from the climate in those areas today you have no doubt read that people once lived in regions now covered by the sahara desert this is true just when is not entirely clear the theory is that during the time of the glaciers there was a broad belt of rain winds south of the glaciers these rain winds would have kept north africa the nile valley and the middle east green and fertile but when the glaciers melted back to the north the belt of rain winds is supposed to have moved north too then the people living south and east of the mediterranean would have found that their water supply was drying up that the animals they hunted were dying or moving away and that the plant foods they collected were dried up and scarce according to the theory all this would have been true except in the valleys of rivers and in oases in the growing deserts here in the only places where water was left the man and animals and plants would have clustered they would have been forced to live close to one another in order to live at all presently the men would have seen that some animals were more useful or made better food than others and so they would have begun to protect these animals from their natural enemies the men would also have been forced to try new food plants foods which possibly had to be prepared before they could be eaten thus with trials and errors but by being forced to live close to plants and animals men would have learned to domesticate them the old theory too simple for the facts this theory was set up before we really knew anything in detail about the later prehistory of the near and middle east we now know that the facts which have been found don't fit the old theory at all well also i have yet to find an american meteorologist who feels that we know enough about the changes in the weather pattern to say that it could have been so simple and direct and of course the glacial age which began melting after twelve thousand years ago was merely the last subphase of the last great glaciation there had also been three earlier periods of great alpine glaciers and long periods of warm weather in between if the rain belt moved north as the glaciers melted for the last time it must have moved in the same direction in earlier times thus the forced neighborliness of men plants and animals in river valleys and oases must also have happened earlier why didn't domestication happen earlier then furthermore it does not seem to be in the oases and river valleys that we have our first or only traces of either food production or the earliest farming villages these traces are also in the hill flanks of the mountains of western asia our earliest sites of the village farmers do not seem to indicate a greatly different climate from that which the same region now shows in fact everything we now know suggests that the old theory was just too simple an explanation to have been the true one the only reason i mention it 
beyond correcting the ideas you may get in the general texts is that it illustrates the kind of thinking we shall have to do even if it is doubtless wrong in detail we archaeologists shall have to depend much more than we ever have on the natural scientists who can really help us i can tell you this from experience i had the great good fortune to have on my expedition staff in iraq in nineteen fifty four to fifty five a geologist a botanist and a zoologist their studies added whole new bands of color to my spectrum of thinking about how and why the revolution took place and how the village farming community began but it was only a beginning as i said earlier we are just now learning to ask the proper questions about stages and eras now come some definitions so i may describe my material more easily archaeologists have always loved to make divisions and subdivisions within the long range of materials which they have found they often disagree violently about which particular assemblage of material goes into which subdivision about what the subdivisions should be named about what the subdivisions really mean culturally some archaeologists probably through habit favor an old scheme of grassized names for the subdivisions paleolithic mesolithic neolithic i refuse to use these words myself they have meant too many different things to too many different people and have tended to hide some pretty fuzzy thinking probably you haven't even noticed my own scheme of subdivision up to now but i'd better tell you in general what it is i think of the earliest great group of archaeological materials from which we can deduce only a food-gathering way of culture as the food-gathering stage i say stage rather than age because it is not quite over yet there are still a few primitive people in out-of-the-way parts of the world who remain in the food-gathering stage in fact professor julian stewart would probably prefer to call it a food-gathering level of existence rather than a stage this would be perfectly acceptable to me i also tend to find myself using collecting rather than gathering for the more recent aspects or era of this stage as the word collecting appears to have more sense of purposefulness and specialization than does gathering now while i think we could make several possible subdivisions of the food gathering stage i call my subdivisions of stages eras i believe the only one which means much to us here is the last or terminal sub era of food collecting of the whole food gathering stage the microliths seem to mark its approach in the northwestern part of the old world it is really shown best in the old world by the materials of the forest folk the cultural adaptation to the post-glacial environment in northwestern europe we talked about the forest folk at the beginning of this chapter and i used the maglemosian assemblage of denmark as an example the food producing revolution ushers in the food producing stage this stage began to be replaced by the industrial stage only about two hundred years ago now notice that my stage divisions are in terms of technology and economics we must think sharply to be sure that the subdivisions of the stages the eras are in the same terms this does not mean that i think technology and economics are the only important realms of culture it is rather that for most of prehistoric time the materials left to the archaeologists tend to limit our deductions to technology and economics i'm so soon out of my competence as conventional ancient history begins that i shall only suggest the earlier eras of the food producing stage to you this book is about prehistory and i'm not a universal historian the two earliest eras of the food producing stage the food producing stage seems to appear in western asia with really revolutionary suddenness it is seen by the relative speed with which the traces of new crafts appear in the earliest village farming community sites we've dug it is seen by the spread and multiplication of these sites themselves and the remarkable growth in human population we deduce from this increase in sites we'll look at some of these sites and the archaeological traces they yield in the next chapter
when such village sites begin to appear i believe we are in the era of the primary village farming community i also believe this is the second era of the food producing stage the first era of the food producing stage i believe was an era of incipient cultivation and animal domestication i keep saying i believe because the actual evidence for this earlier era is so slight that one has to set it up mainly by playing a hunch for it the reason for playing the hunch goes about as follows one thing we seem to be able to see in the food collecting era in general is a tendency for people to begin to settle down this settling down seems to become further intensified in the terminal era how this is connected with professor mathiason's receptiveness and the tendency to be experimental we do not exactly know the evidence from the new world comes into play here as well as that from the old world with this settling down in one place the people of the terminal era especially the forest folk whom we know best began making a great variety of new things i remarked about this earlier in the chapter dr robert m adams is of the opinion that this atmosphere of experimentation with new tools and with new ways of collecting food is the kind of atmosphere in which one might expect trials at planting and at animal domestication to have been made we first begin to find traces of more permanent life in outdoor campsites although caves were still inhabited at the beginning of the terminal era it is not surprising at all that the forest folk had already domesticated the dog in this sense the whole era of food collecting was becoming ready and almost incipient for cultivation and animal domestication northwestern europe was not the place for really effective beginnings in agriculture and animal domestication these would have had to take place in one of those natural environments of promise where a variety of plants and animals each possible of domestication was available in the wild state let me spell this out really effective food production must include a variety of items to make up a reasonably well-rounded diet the food supply so produced must be trustworthy even though the food producing peoples themselves might be happy to supplement it with fish and wild strawberries just as we do when such things are available so as we said earlier part of our problem is that of finding a region with a natural environment which includes and did include some ten thousand years ago a variety of possibly domesticatable wild plants and animals nuclear areas now comes the last of my definitions a region with a natural environment which included a variety of wild plants and animals both possible and ready for domestication would be a central or core or nuclear area that is it would be when and if food production took place within it it is pretty hard for me to imagine food production having ever made an independent start outside such a nuclear area although there may be some possible nuclear areas in which food production never took place possibly in parts of africa for example we know of several such nuclear areas in the new world middle america and the andean highlands make up one or two it is my understanding that the evidence is not yet clear as to which there seems to have been a nuclear area somewhere in southeastern asia in the malay peninsula or burma perhaps connected with the early cultivation of taro breadfruit the banana and the mango possibly the cultivation of rice and the domestication of the chicken and of zebu cattle and the water buffalo belong to this southeast asiatic nuclear area we know relatively little about it archaeologically as yet the nuclear area which was the scene of the earliest experiment in effective food production was in western asia since i know it best i shall use it as my example the nuclear near east the nuclear area of western asia is naturally the one of greatest interest to people of the western cultural tradition our cultural heritage began within it the area itself is the region of the hilly flanks of rain-watered grassland which build up to the high mountain ridges of iran iraq turkey syria and palestine 
if you have a good atlas try to locate the zone which surrounds the drainage basin of the tigris and euphrates rivers at elevations of from approximately two thousand to five thousand feet the lower alluvial land of the tigris euphrates basin itself has very little rainfall some years ago professor james henry breasted called the alluvial lands of the tigris euphrates a part of the fertile crescent these alluvial lands are very fertile if irrigated breasted was most interested in the oriental civilizations of conventional ancient history and irrigation had been discovered before they appeared the country of hilly flanks above breasted's crescent receives from ten to twenty or more inches of winter rainfall each year which is about what kansas has above the hilly flanks zone tower the peaks and ridges of the lebanon amanus chain bordering the coastline from palestine to turkey the taurus mountains of southern turkey and the zagros range of the iraq iran borderland this rugged mountain frame for our hilly flanks zone rises to some magnificent alpine scenery with peaks of from ten to fifteen thousand feet in elevation there are several gaps in the mediterranean coastal portion of the frame through which the winter's rain-bearing winds from the sea may break so as to carry rain to the foothills of the taurus and the zagros the picture i hope you will have from this description is that of an intermediate hilly flanks zone lying between two regions of extremes the lower tigris euphrates basin land is low and far too dry and hot for agriculture based on rainfall alone to the south and southwest it merges directly into the great desert of arabia the mountains which lie above the hilly flanks zone are much too high and rugged to have encouraged farmers the natural environment of the nuclear near east the more we learn of this hilly flanks zone that i describe the more it seems surely to have been a nuclear area this is where we archaeologists need and are beginning to get the help of natural scientists they are coming to the conclusion that the natural environment of the hilly flanks zone today is much as it was some eight to ten thousand years ago there are still two kinds of wild wheat and a wild barley and the wild sheep goat and pig we have discovered traces of each of these at about nine thousand years ago also traces of wild ox horse and dog each of which appears to be the probable ancestor of the domesticated form in fact at about nine thousand years ago the two wheats the barley and at least the goat were already well on the road to domestication the wild wheats give us an interesting clue they are only available together with the wild barley within the hilly flanks zone while the wild barley grows in a variety of elevations and beyond the zone at least one of the wild wheats does not seem to grow below the hill country as things look at the moment the domestication of both the wheats together could only ha have taken place within the hilly flanks zone barley seems to have first come into cultivation due to its presence as a weed in already cultivated wheat fields there is also a suggestion there is still much more to learn in the matter that the animals which were first domesticated were most at home up in the hilly flanks zone in their wild state with a single exception that of the dog the earliest positive evidence of domestication includes the two forms of wheat the barley and the goat the evidence comes from within the hilly flank zone however it comes from a settled village proper jarmo which i'll describe in the next chapter and is thus from the era of the primary village farming community we are still without positive evidence of domesticated grain and animals in the first era of the food-producing stage that of incipient cultivation and animal domestication the era of incipient cultivation and animal domestication i said above that my era of incipient cultivation and animal domestication is mainly set up by playing a hunch although we cannot really demonstrate it and certainly not in the near east it would be very strange for food collectors not to have known a great deal about the plants and animals most useful to them they do seem to have domesticated the dog we can easily imagine them remembering to go back season after season 
to a particular patch of ground where seeds or acorns or berries grew particularly well most human beings unless they are extremely hungry are attracted to baby animals and many wild pups or fawns or piglets must have been brought back alive by hunting parties in this last sense man has probably always been an incipient cultivator and domesticator but i believe that adams is right in suggesting that this would be doubly true with the experimenters of the terminal era of food collecting we noticed that they also seemed to have had a tendency to settle down now my hunch goes that when this experimentation and settling down took place within a potential nuclear area where a whole constellation of plants and animals possible of domestication was available the change was easily made professor charles a reed our field colleague in zoology agrees that year-round settlement with plant domestication probably came before there were important animal domestications incipient eras and nuclear areas i have put this scheme into a simple chart with the names of a few of the sites we are going to talk about you will see that my hunch means that there are eras of incipient cultivation only within nuclear areas in a nuclear area the terminal era of food collecting would probably have been quite short i do not know for how long a time the era of incipient cultivation and domestication would have lasted but perhaps for several thousand years then it passed on into the era of the primary village farming community outside a nuclear area the terminal era of food collecting would last for a long time in a few out-of-the-way parts of the world it still hangs on it would end in any particular place through contact with and the spread of ideas of people who had passed on into one of the more developed eras in many cases the terminal era of food collecting was ended by the incoming of the food producing peoples themselves for example the practices of food production were carried into europe by the actual movement of some numbers of peoples we don't know how many who had reached at least the level of the primary village farming community the forest folk learned food production from them there was never an era of incipient cultivation and domestication proper in europe if my hunch is right archaeological difficulties in seeing the incipient era the way i see it two things were required in order that an era of incipient cultivation and domestication could begin first there had to be the natural environment of a nuclear area with its whole group of plants and animals capable of domestication this is the aspect of the matter which we've said is directly given by nature but it is quite possible that such an environment with such a group of plants and animals in it may have existed well before ten thousand years ago in the near east it is also quite possible that the same promising condition may have existed in regions which never developed into nuclear areas proper here again we come back to the cultural factor i think it was that atmosphere of experimentation we've talked about once or twice before i can't define it for you other than to say that by the end of the ice age the general level of many cultures was ready for change ask me how and why this was so and i'll tell you that we don't know yet and that if we did understand this kind of question there would be no need for me to go on being a prehistorian now since this was an era of incipience of the birth of new ideas and of experimentation it is very difficult to see its traces archaeologically new tools having to do with the new ways of getting and in fact producing food would have taken some time to develop it need not surprise us too much if we cannot find hoes for planting and sickles for reaping grain at the very beginning we might expect a time of making do with some of the older tools or with makeshift tools for some of the new jobs the present-day wild cousin of the domesticated sheep still lives in the mountains of western asia it has no wool only a fine down under hair like that of a deer so it does not surprise us to find neither the whorls used for spinning nor traces of woolen cloth 
it must have taken some time for a wool-bearing sheep to develop and also time for the invention of the new tools which go with weaving it would have been the same with other kinds of tools for the new way of life it is difficult even for an experienced comparative zoologist to tell which are the bones of domesticated animals and which are those of their wild cousins this is especially so because the animal bones the archaeologists find are usually fragmentary furthermore we do not have a sort of library collection of the skeletons of the animals or an herbarium of the plants of those times against which the traces which the archaeologists find may be checked we are only beginning to get such collections for the modern wild forms of animals and plants from some of our nuclear areas in the nuclear area in the near east some of the wild animals at least have already become extinct there are no longer wild cattle or wild horses in western asia we know they were there from the finds we've made in caves of late ice age times and from some slightly later sites sites with antiquities of the incipient era so far we know only a very few sites which would suit my notion of the incipient era of cultivation and animal domestication i am closing this chapter with descriptions of two of the best near eastern examples i know of you may not be satisfied that what i am able to describe makes a full-bodied era of development at all remember however that i've told you i'm largely playing a kind of a hunch and also that the archaeological materials of this era will always be extremely difficult to interpret at the beginning of any new way of life there will be a great tendency for people to make do at first with tools and habits they are already used to i would suspect that a great deal of this making do went on almost to the end of this era the natufian an assemblage of the incipient era the assemblage called the natufian comes from the upper layers of a number of caves in palestine traces of its flint industry have also turned up in syria and lebanon we don't know just how old it is i guess that it probably falls within five hundred years either way of about five thousand b c until recently the people who produced the natufian assemblage were thought to have been only cave dwellers but now at least three open-air natufian sites have been briefly described in their best-known dwelling place on mount carmel the natufian folk lived in the open mouth of a large rock shelter and on the terrace in front of it on the terrace they had set at least two short curving lines of stones but these were hardly architecture they seemed more like benches or perhaps the low walls of open pens there were also one or two small clusters of stones laid like paving and a ring of stones around a hearth or fireplace one very round and regular basin-shaped depression had been cut into the rocky floor of the terrace and there were other less regular basin-like depressions in the newly reported open-air sites there seems to have been huts with rounded corners most of the finds in the natufian layer of the mount carmel cave were flints about eighty per cent of these flint tools were microliths made by the regular working of tiny blades into various tools some having geometric forms the larger flint tools included backed blades burins scrapers a few arrow points some larger hacking or picking tools and one special type this last was the sickle blade we know a sickle blade of flint when we see one because of a strange polish or sheen which seems to develop on the cutting edge when the blade has been used to cut grasses or grain or perhaps reeds in the natufian we even have found the straight bone handles in which a number of flint sickle blades were set in a line there was a small industry in ground or pecked stone that is abraded not chipped in the natufian this included some pestle and mortar fragments the mortars are said to have a deep and narrow hole and some of the pestles show traces of red ochre we are not sure that these mortars and pestles were also used for grinding food in addition there were one or two bits of carving in stone natufian antiquities in other materials burials and people the natufian industry in bone was quite rich it included beside the sickle hafts mentioned above 
points and harpoons straight and curved types of fish hooks awls pins and needles and a variety of beads and pendants there were also beads and pendants of pierced teeth and shell a number of natufian burials have been found in the caves some burials were grouped together in one grave the people who were buried within the mount carmel cave were laid on their backs in an extended position while those on the terrace seem to have been flexed placed in their graves in a curled up position this may mean no more than it was easier to dig a long hole in cave dirt than in the hard-packed dirt of the terrace the people often had some kind of object buried with them and several of the best collections of beads come from the burials on two of the skulls there were traces of elaborate headdresses of shell beads the animal bones of the natufian layers show beasts of a modern type but with some differences from those of present-day palestine the bones of the gazelle far outnumber those of the deer since gazelles like a much drier climate than deer palestine must then have had much the same climate that it has today some of the animal bones were those of large or dangerous beasts the hyena the bear the wild boar and the leopard but the natufian people may have had the help of a large domesticated dog if our guess at a date for the natufian is right about seven thousand seven hundred fifty b c this is an earlier dog than was that in the maglemosian of northern europe more recently it has been reported that a domesticated goat is also part of the natufian finds the study of the human bones from the natufian burials is not yet complete until professor mccown's study becomes available we may note professor coon's assessment that these people were of a basically mediterranean type the karim shahir assemblage karim shahir differs from the natufian sites in that it shows traces of a temporary open site or encampment it lies on the top of a bluff in the kurdish hill country of northeastern iraq it was dug by dr bruce howe of the expedition i directed in nineteen fifty to fifty one for the oriental institute and the american schools of oriental research in nineteen fifty four to fifty five our expedition located another site malafat with general resemblance to karim shahir but about a hundred miles north of it in nineteen fifty six dr ralph selecki located still another karim shahir type of site called zawi kemi shanidar the zawi kemi site has a radiocarbon date of eight thousand nine hundred plus or minus three hundred b c karim shahir has evidence of only one very shallow level of occupation it was probably not lived on very long although the people who lived on it spread out over about three acres of area in spots the single layer yielded great numbers of fist-sized cracked pieces of limestone which had been carried up from the bed of a stream at the bottom of the bluff we think these cracked stones had something to do with a kind of architecture but we were unable to find positive traces of hut plans at malafat and zawi kemi there were traces of rounded hut plans as in the natufian the great bulk of small objects of the karim shahir assemblage was in chipped flint a large proportion of the flint tools were microlithic bladelets and geometric forms the flint sickle blade was almost non-existent being far scarcer than in the natufian the people of karim shahir did a modest amount of work in the grinding of stone there were milling stone fragments of both the mortar and the kern type and stone hoes or axes with polished bits beads pendants rings and bracelets were made of finer quality stone we found a few simple points and needles of bone and even two rather formless unbaked clay figurines which seemed to be of animal form karim shahir did not yield direct evidence of the kind of vegetable food its people ate the animal bones showed a considerable increase in the proportion of the bones of the species capable of domestication sheep goat cattle horse dog as compared with animal bones from the earlier cave sites of the area which have a high proportion of bones of wild forms like deer and gazelle 
but we do not know that any of the karim shahir animals were actually domesticated some of them may have been in an incipient way but we have no means at the moment that will tell us from the bones alone were the natufian and karim shahir peoples food producers it is clear that a great part of the food of the natufian people must have been hunted or collected shells of land fresh water and sea animals occur in their cave layers the same is true as regards karim shahir save for seashells but on the other hand we have the sickles the milling stones the possible natufian dog and the goat and the general animal situation at karim shahir to hint at an incipient approach to food production at karim shahir there was the tendency to settle down out in the open this is echoed by the new reports of open-air natufian sites the large number of cracked stones certainly indicates that it was worth the people's while to have some kind of structure even if the site as a whole was short-lived it is a part of my hunch that these things all point toward food production that the hints we seek are there but in the sense that the peoples of the era of the primary village farming community which we shall look at next are fully food producing the natufian and karim shahir folk had not yet arrived i think they were part of a general build-up to full-scale food production they were possibly controlling a few animals of several kinds and perhaps one or two plants without realizing the full possibilities of this control as a new way of life this is why i think of the karim shahir and natufian folk as being at a level or in an era of incipient cultivation and domestication but we shall have to do a great deal more excavation in this range of time before we'll get the kind of positive information we need summary i am sorry that this chapter has had to be so much more about ideas than about the archaeological traces of prehistoric men themselves but the antiquities of the incipient era of cultivation and animal domestication will not be spectacular even when we do have them excavated in quantity few museums will be interested in these antiquities for exhibition purposes the charred bits or impressions of plants the fragments of animal bone and shell and the varied clues to climate and environment will be as important as the artifacts themselves it will be the ideas to which these traces lead us that will be important i am sure that this unspectacular material when we have much more of it and learn how to understand what it says will lead us to how and why answers about the first great change in human history we know the earliest village farming communities appeared in western asia in a nuclear area we do not yet know why the near eastern experiment came first or why it didn't happen earlier in some other nuclear area apparently the level of culture and the promise of the natural environment were ready first in western asia the next sites we look at will show a simple but effective food production already in existence without effective food production and the settled village farming communities civilization never could have followed how effective food production came into being by the end of the incipient era is i believe one of the most fascinating questions any archaeologist could face it now seems probable from possibly two of the palestinian sites with varieties of the natufian jericho and nahal oren that there were one or more local palestinian developments out of the natufian into later times in the same way what followed after the karim shahir type of assemblage in northeastern iraq was in some ways a reflection of beginnings made at karim shahir and zawi kemi end of end and prelude